Amen. Well, if you haven't been with us at Grace, uh, we have been going through the life of Joseph, and we're talking about Joseph, coat of many colors, Joseph. Or if you were with us week one, we found out it's not actually a coat of many colors. It just means the man had some sleeves. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Pastor Josh equated it to a Gucci robe. You know what I'm saying? Imagine that. It's kind of like what he was wearing. So we're talking about this Joseph. Um, If you didn't see those first two weeks, the story went that Joseph was the son of Jacob. He's one of many brothers. Um, Joseph was also Jacob's favorite, right? And he let his brothers know that. Uh, and because of that, they hated him. So Joseph, Joseph's life this far has been a roller coaster. You know what I'm saying? It's got really good moments. He's the big brother. He's the brother with the, the coat of many colors. And then they hate him. And it's, he's in the pit, right? Because they hated him. They had this plan to kill him. They decided not to kill him, but they left him in this pit for a little bit. Uh, and so that's where we stopped week one as we talked about the pit and how God wants to use the pit oftentimes in our lives uh, to do good things, to bring about change and growth and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and then second week, uh, we talked about how Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, uh, which, you know, negative start started in the valley, but then things went up for Joseph because he became uh, somebody to run Potiphar's house, right? Huge in this. Like he was right there, up there with these big dogs, just doing good things, running the whole house. Potiphar trusted him with everything. And then Potiphar's wife got weird, right? It just got real and a pro pro out there. And so Joseph had to run away from her, tried not to get in trouble with her, but he still got in trouble. He tried to do the right thing and it was all taken from him. And that's where we ended last week uh, is Joseph is in a deep, dark place and he is now in prison, right? Joseph was thrown into prison uh, and wrongfully convicted, right, of uh, trying to sleep with Potiphar's wife and hurt her. So that's where we're picking up today. But before we go any further in the story, I just think it's necessary to take a moment and feel for my man, Joseph. Like, look at this life, y'all. If there was one word to summarize how things have started for Joseph, I would say terrible. You know what I mean? It's just like every time things get going good, there's a deep drop. And it just keeps going, keeps going. And then he hits this really deep place of prison. Like if you're him, like for sure, week one, probably his fault. You know what I mean? Like he kind of deserved the pit. Like, like, like Josh was saying, it's like he was being kind of snobby, boastful, like I'm dad's favorite. You know what I'm saying? How many of you guys have that sibling that's like, well, I'm the favorite. You know what I mean? Okay, let's be real. How many of y'all are that sibling? Like I'm the favorite, you know? That's, yeah, exactly. I was, I was the baby in the family, so all my siblings hated me just naturally. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, they're like, you get everything. Mom and dad would never let me do that. I'm like, well, sucks for you. Um, but that was, sorry, excuse me. Don't fire me, Josh. Um, that was me, though, right? And we see that with Joseph, so he may, he may have deserved the pit. But week two, Potiphar's wife wasn't Joseph's fault. We can all agree that Joseph was trying to do the right thing, amen? He did the right thing. I mean, you look at that passage of scripture and he's not even like, hey, we can't do this because I don't want Potiphar to get mad. Like, sure, that's in there somewhere. But ultimately he's like, you expect me to sin against God in that way? Like, he's like, no, no, no. This would be wrong in the sight of the Lord and that's what matters most. Like, how's your soul, right? Last week, Joseph's soul was in a good place with the Lord. He was in right standing with God and he wanted to keep that moving But Potiphar's wife got weird and he got thrown into prison. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Have you ever experienced something like that where your goal, what you're doing is you're just striving to do the right thing and maybe you even do the right thing, but things still go wrong. You still experience a negative impact or consequence even though you did what you were supposed to do. Has that ever been you? Let me tell you a story real quick. So um, when I was in middle school, I lived in West Point, New York. It's a beautiful place. Um, I think it's one of the greatest places to grow up as a, a young teenager. Um, one of the reasons, because it was a much safer space for us to grow up in. On post, there was like, we lived in basically a little valley between two mountains where all the housing was. And it was just, it was super safe. The biggest worry was like, you might run into like, you know, a 12 point buck in the middle of the road and then you're screaming and running away because he's chasing, you know what? It's like, that was a real thing. Some bears every now and then. But it was pretty safe. So uh, 
all my friends and I, usually our parents are really chill about like, yeah, just go. Like, go do your thing, hang out, be outside, go have fun, all that good stuff. So we did that very often. Well, one night, uh, my buddy Carter and I, Carter, Carter and I were friends to this day. Uh, we were walking home from a movie. So they had a theater uh, down at the actual academy where the cadets stayed. Uh, and we can go see movies for real cheap. And so we're walking back. And it's getting a little bit later. Not past curfew, though. You know, I think curf- curfew was midnight or 1130 or something like that. So we're walking home from the theater. And while we're walking, we're walking next to this cemetery, and there's a little rock wall, and we're just chilling on the sidewalk, getting home, you know, just being peaceful, angelic little boys. You know what I'm saying? Just getting there. And all of a sudden, this MP comes by. For those who don't know, it's a military policeman, right? So comes by, and like, we're like, oh, you know, you always get to shiver, like, am I doing something wrong? You check yourself real quick. What am I doing? Walk straight, you know? So he comes by, passes us, and out of the peripheral, we can see just lights all of a sudden, right when he gets past us, and we're like, yo. I look at Carter, and I'm like, what'd you do? <laughs> And he turns around, hits a U-turn in the middle of the street, and he pulls up next to us, and we, we, you know, we stop. We're not just going to run. You know, it's like, what's up, Mr. Officer, sir? <laughs> and he gets out of his car, and he's like, what are you guys doing? He's like, just walking, walking home. From where? You know, he gives us the whole rundown. How old are you? Where do you live? We're like, we're just going home from the movie, sir. Like, we, we, were, we just saw this movie. I'm like, what movie? You know, I was like, all right, look, man. Seriously, we're innocent. We're just walking home. He's like, oh, Really? Because I just got a few calls that there's two teenage boys, specifically two, ding dong ditching in this neighborhood over here. You sure it wasn't you? Yes. You know what I mean? Well, tonight it wasn't us. You know what I mean? Maybe other times. <laughs> you could have got me like two nights ago, but right now, angelic. You know what I'm saying? It's like, did you see my halo? Look. So really, I'll, I'll tell you guys, I'm being honest, that night we were innocent. Other nights, maybe we did things we shouldn't have, but the past is the past, and we don't look at that right now. <laughs> so we're walking home, innocent, and he's like, no. And the dude just keeps pressing, y'all. He's like, are you sure? He's like, seriously, guys, I really think, and I was like, are you trying to convince me that I did this? Because I promised, he's like, we went lawyer mode, like, come on, we're going court case, everything. The dude just did not believe us, right? So we had to sit down. He made us sit on that wall I was talking about. And we're sitting there, and he's like, all right, you know what I need you guys to do? Usually, we had these, we had these moments, and usually, like, hey, you guys need to head home. Like, just get home straight. If I see you again, you're getting in trouble. It's like, cool, we're out. It's like, this guy was like, sit down, call your parents. I was like, dude, you don't want to get mama involved. You know what I'm saying? Sure enough, he did. He was like, you need to call your parents, and you need to tell them that they either need to come get you. I need to talk to them on the phone. Or it's like, all right, so we did this whole thing. I called my mom. I was like, and I was frustrated. Okay? He was like, dude, we're innocent. Like, we, we didn't do anything. Just walking home, not past curfew, anything like that. So I call my mom. I was like, I'm just letting you know, if my mom gets mad at me, you're in trouble. You know what I mean? It's like, so I called my mom. Then we had to like go to court with our parents, not actual court, but like explain to them, like, here's why we're innocent. Here's how we're innocent. It was just a whole ordeal. Silly story. Have you ever been there? Have you ever like just been doing the right thing? Step by step, everything you're doing is, it's good. It's all good. And you still receive the negative consequence, the negative impact in your life. Have you ever been there? I think we all have our stories. We all have those seasons, those moments where like, dude, I feel like every time I try to just keep doing the right thing, I'm pushing forward, it just gets worse. Life just knocks me down over and over and over again. Here's the real honest moment. In those seasons when things don't go our way, when seasons get hard and life is just knocking us down, we have a tendency as human beings to try to match the energy of our circumstance. Do you get what I'm saying? It's like we have a tendency, if things are real rough and they're hard, we get real rough. We're like, "Mm -mm, I'm not about this. I'm frustrated. I'm overwhelmed. I'm angry. I'm getting dramatic. Ask me, I get dramatic. You know, I'm getting dramatic. Have you ever been there? It's like you try to match the energy of your circumstance because it's overwhelming. It's frustrating. It makes you angry. Like, I'll be real. When I was dealing with the MP, I I like to think that I grew up and, and my mom taught me how to be somewhat respectful, you know, to authority, all that stuff. But it was like, this man was getting under my skin, y'all. And I was like, this is not cool, dude. And I was getting frustrated and disrespectful. And it's like, I was trying to match the energy of the circumstance because it was really hard to deal with. We do that. We get frustrated. We let the circumstance bleed into our hearts and we let it impact who we are. We don't let it stay as just what's happening. You know what I'm talking about? It's a very real thing. And I think if we're being honest, we have that tendency. When things don't go great, we tend to not respond so great. And I get it. The situations are hard. Now look at Joseph. And let's think back to his situation. Joseph is going through it, y'all. Constantly. First hated, then a slave, then a prisoner. 
It's just rough. If there's anybody who's got the right in the space to go, dude, I'm going to match this energy and I'm just going to be frustrated. Like, I'm just done. Like, I don't want anything to do with this. I'm just kind of giving up. Joseph kind of has a right here, right? So this is what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at his story. We're going to move forward on when he gets into prison and what happens after that to see how he responds. Because the truth is, is his response might surprise you. His response might change the way that we, in our own humanity, look at our responses and what we're doing. So let's take a look at this story. Uh, let's move forward. We're going to be in Genesis 40. So if you want to pull out your Bible, you want to open the app, and we're going to have it on the screens as well. But we're going to go through the whole chapter, okay? And we're not going to read every single verse, but we're going to bounce through this and see all the things that happen with Joseph. So again, he is currently in prison, okay? Joseph uh, is serving 25 to life right now. And uh, while he's in there, um, he quickly, this is kind of a, a cool thing. So he, when he gets put into prison, he's actually put in the prison of the captain of the guard. So he's put basically in Potiphar's prison. Like Potiphar is over this whole thing in his own house, in his own realm, if you will. Uh, and Joseph is placed there. And while he's there, he's also quickly put in charge. Like he's asked to lead in the prison and to make sure things run smoothly. I, I just wanna step to the side and have this little side note on what's happening here. Uh, last week, Josh kind of mentioned this too, is Potiphar seems to still have some kind of love for Joseph. You know what I'm saying? Like when everything happened, like at that point in time, it could have been easy with, with when Potiphar's wife got weird to go like, oh, this dude needs to be put to death. Like get him out of here. You know what I mean? Like we're done with him. But it's not what he does, right? He's like, ah, oh, let's put him in prison. And he's frustrated, but he's like, let's put him in prison. In fact, let's put him in something that I still have control over, or I can still kind of pull some strings and have Joseph around. So um, again, this is leaning in, and I'm just kind of assuming on this. But I think what you see here is you see Potiphar has some love for Joseph still. Potiphar, Potiphar sees Joseph as somebody of value. He's like, man, this guy came into my house from, as a slave, and he made the whole thing better. He ran my household and everything in it so, so well. It would be a shame to lose this guy. Like he sees Joseph as a major asset for his house. You know what I'm saying? He's like, I can't lose this guy. And also being the person that Potiphar probably trusted most in that time, he probably, he's, got some, he's got some friendship there, some connection, a good relationship with Joseph. And so it's like when somebody does something wrong to us, oftentimes we're, we're frustrated, but deep down we're saddened by the fact that they did something they shouldn't have and it hurts our heart. So again, leaning into that a little more and a, a little bit of an assumption, but I think that Potiphar's heart kind of breaks for Joseph. And so he tries to keep him around as a resource and as somebody he cares for a little bit. So here's what happens. Joseph is in prison. He's hanging out. He's leading, still using some gifts. And what happened is, uh, what happens is he gets two new friends, okay? These two new friends that are going to spend some time with Joseph. The first one is a cupbearer. He is the Pharaoh's cupbearer. The second one is the chief baker for the Pharaoh and for the royal family. So if you don't know what a cupbearer is, back in these times and, and for a while, uh, royal families and kings and queens, they would have somebody that would pour and hand them their drinks, okay? The reason behind this is they needed somebody that they could trust. So this was an appointed person. It wasn't like just turning some applications and we'll see. It was like, no, no, no. This is somebody they handpicked because they wanted to trust that the drink that they were drinking was safe, right? Lots of uh, assassination attempts, if you will, on the, on the royal families uh, through poisoning in their drinks. So they're like, hey, we need somebody we can trust so we can know. And in fact, we actually want somebody who's even willing to test it out every now and then. You know, imagine that. What a job. You know what I mean? It's like, hey, Farrell's in a mood today. He wants you to make sure that his drink isn't poison. You're like, oh, me? You know, <laughs> sip. It's good. You know what I mean? Like, they didn't put that in the application process, but it's literally what they asked him to do. So every now and then he would check for some poison and make sure Pharaoh could still stay alive. So I was like, if he dies, oh, good. He made sure I was safe. But that was his role. The baker, right? Just the Gordon Ramsay of Egypt. That's it, okay? Chief baker. He made sure that the royal family had good food. You want some cookies? We'll make you some cookies. That was it. Now, these guys get thrown into prison, and it doesn't exactly say why. It just says that Pharaoh was just angry, like extremely angry with these dudes. They did something to make him mad, so he throws them in with Joseph. So what happens is while they're there, um, one night they have these dreams, 
And these dreams are real weird. They're different. And they don't quite understand what they are, but they feel like there's some significance to what they just dreamed about. And this is where we're going to pick up in Scripture, Genesis 40, verses 6 through 7. The next morning, after the night that they had their dreams, uh, Joseph comes to them uh, while they're sitting around. So Genesis 40, 6 through 7 says, When Joseph saw them the next morning, he noticed that they both looked upset. Why do you look so worried today? He asked them. This is so funny to me. Joseph comes in in the morning, you know, he's just, you know, got a cup of coffee. I don't know if they gave him coffee in prison, but he's walking around and he's like, hey guys, you know, smile on his face. Why do you guys look so sad? Just like, if you're the cupbearer, the baker, you're like, prison, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's just, oh, it's the weather, Joseph. Uh, the weather's just got me down. He's like, what do you mean, dude? I just got sentenced to prison by the Pharaoh. I'm not really in a great mood right now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, those people around you, your friends who are like just always happy about everything. And you're like, dude, can you just be upset for two seconds with me? You know what I mean? Like misery loves company, man. Join me for a few, you know? It's like, what are you talking about, Joseph? So they ask him this, or they say that to him. He asks them that question, and they're like, oh, well, the issue, the actual issue, the reason we're upset is because we both had dreams last night, Joseph, and we don't really know what these dreams meant, but we feel like there's some, some value in these dreams, and we want to know what they mean. So this is a really cool thing, because how blessed are they to be with Joseph somebody who God has given the gift of interpreting dreams to, right? So remember back in week one, that's how his brother started to hate him. He had a dream that he was above them, right? And he told him about it. And he was actually correct in his dream. And this won't see that till later, but he was right. So how blessed are they to be with Joseph? So then we jump on into verse eight. And here's what it says. Joseph responds, interpreting dreams is God's business. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. So the chief cupbearer, he starts, told Joseph his dream. In my dream, he said, I saw a grapevine in front of me. The vine had three branches that began to bud and blossom, and soon it produced clusters of ripe grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand, so I took a cluster of grapes and squeezed the juice into the cup. Then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. So Joseph interprets the dream, and he tells the cupbearer, okay, here's what God says your dream means. He says, in three days, the three branches represent the three days. In three days, you are going to be restored as Pharaoh's cupbearer. Let's go. Make some noise for the cupbearer, church. Come on. That's fantastic, right? You get your job back, dude. you like, just three days and you're out of here, man. What a quick little hangout sesh you had with us here in prison. Now you get to go back. He's going to lift your head up and you will be his guy again. Back to drinking poison, potentially. Congrats for you. Kind of an iffy thing, but so he's like, that's good news. So you cut bears probably excited. He's like, all right, three days and I'm out of here. Thank God. Like, let's go. So what happens next is the baker, the chief baker is like, oh, okay. That's some good news. You know, I, I'm in prison. Things are rough. I, I would like some good news. So then he asked Joseph to interpret his dream. So he tells him his dream, Genesis 40, 16 through 17. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had given the first dream such a positive interpretation, he said to Joseph, I had a dream too. In my dream, there were three baskets of white pastries stacked on my head. The top basket contained all kinds of pastries for Pharaoh, but the birds came and ate them from the basket on my head. She's like, all right, tell me, what does this mean? Does it mean I'm gonna get a lot of food or something like that? Or I'm gonna have a few pet birds? Like, tell me what this means, right? And so Joseph interprets his dream. He goes, hey, in three days, three baskets, Pharaoh's gonna have you killed. He's gonna hang you on a tree and the birds are gonna pick at your flesh. Awkward. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Can you imagine that? He's like, are you sure that was right? <laughs> you wanna run? Just think about it a few more minutes and I'll come back to you, you know what I mean? It's like the cut bear is probably over there like, yo, this is crazy, you know? It's like, that stinks, that's gotta be tough, right? I mean, props to Joseph for coming in and just going, hey man, I'm just gonna shoot you straight. This is what God said your dream means. You know, like not a lot, not no fluff there. Again, I think sometimes we miss that there probably was emotion. I'm sure Joseph was like, look, this is gonna be really hard to say, <laughs> but you're in trouble. You know what I mean? So you can, you can imagine that the next three days were real tense. You know what I mean? I'm sure that 
the cupbearer was not down to play a game of Uno with the other two or anything. Or sorry, the, the chief baker was like, I'm not, I just want to sit. Just sit in silence. That's hard to get that bad news while somebody else gets good stuff. So if you know how the story goes, uh, Joseph's interpretations were 100% correct. Uh, they were 100% from God. And uh, the cupbearer, the, both men in three days are taken before Pharaoh and his officials. And their, their heads are both raised in front of all of them. Uh, the cupbearer is restored and given his position back but the baker was sentenced to death. So the story goes on for Joseph and things get kind of worse. Back when he was interpreting the cupbearer's dream, Joseph asked the cupbearer, and when he he found out like, oh, in three days, you're gonna be in front of Pharaoh. He was like, hey man, um, you're gonna be in front of Pharaoh again in three days. And you know, because I kind of did this and stepped into this and you see that God uses me in great ways, could you do me a favor? Would you be down to let Pharaoh know about me? Like basically like here, here's my resume. Can you let him know that I can interpret dreams and that God uses me in that great way? Because I really would like to get out of this place. I would like to be out of prison. Uh, and I'm actually not even supposed to be in here. I'm innocent, right? So he asked the cupbearer to remember him. Cupbearer's like, I got you, dude. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'll see you in a few days. Totally forgets about Joseph, right? gets his job back, and he's like, this is it. (laughs) And then Joseph is left alone in prison, totally forgotten about. And that is where we're gonna stop with the story of Joseph today. Real high note, okay? So the reason I wanna stop here, though, is because, I mean, I think we read through that passage, we read through chapter 40, and we're like, man, like, life is just rough, again, for Joseph. And he has this cool moment where he interprets the dreams with the cupbearer and with the baker, but he's forgotten, Like, it's all bad, right? It's what it seems like when you just read through it. But I actually don't think that's the case. I think there's so much more in the midst of this moment, in this season of prison for Joseph, I think God had more in there. And I think it's important for us to see that God had more for Joseph there because I think Joseph actually recognized it. So what I wanna stop, I wanna stop and look at these circumstances. I wanna look at what Joseph did, his response to his circumstance, because he actually responds in a miraculous way. So the first thing that I want to take a look at comes from Genesis uh, 39, 22. Okay, so it says, before long, this is the end of chapter 39, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. So back when Joseph just gets placed in prison, he gets a position of authority. He gets leadership again. He gets to step into the gifts that God has given him. I don't know if you guys know that, but those, his gifts of, of leadership and his ability to manage and run things so well, that's God-given, y'all. God gave him those abilities. And not long, right away when he's placed in prison, there's this moment where it's like, here, keep doing these things. He has an opportunity to keep leading in his gifts. And that's exactly what he does. The first thing that Joseph does is he keeps using God's gifts from him. He keeps using the gifts that God is giving him to lead people, to help and serve people. This blows my mind, right? Like if it's me and I'm like, I'm sentenced to prison and I'm innocent and the the people who run the prison are like, hey, will you help us get our job done and do it better? I'm like, you're tripping. You know what I mean? I'm chilling, my harmonica in the cell. I'm gonna do my time and I'm gonna get out. You know what I'm saying? Joseph's like, yeah, sure, I'll take the job. It's like, what are you doing? (laughs) Immediately, he's like, yeah, I'll step into it. I'll keep moving. That's insane, right? And not only that, but he's willing to step in. And when when he gets these two guys, the cupbearer and the baker, they're like, hey, you're gonna take care of these guys. Like, you're gonna watch over them and serve them, make sure they're good. And he's like, yeah, I'll do it. And then they come to him like, we had dreams. We need somebody to interpret them. If you're Joseph, I'm I'm looking at Joseph like, dude, your track record of interpreting dreams has got you in a lot of trouble. Maybe you should stop. You know what I'm saying? It's like, look at this. Look at where it's gotten you. That's me. If I'm just, I'm like, nah, man, I'm done telling dreams. Actually, I don't even want to have dreams. I'm just going to lay down. You know what I mean? It's like, but he's like, yeah, I'll tell, I can tell you what they mean. God uses me in that way. Here, I'll, here, tell me your dreams. That's insane, church. That's miraculous. That's a miracle that he is willing to keep stepping in to the gifts that God has given them, to keep using them in the way that God has called him to. How many of us would struggle with that? How many of us would go, God, why'd you even give these to me? They keep getting me in trouble. How many of us would question what God has called us to do, the calling he's placed in our lives, and if these gifts were, how many of us would just feel lost? But Joseph's like, I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna keep stepping, keep getting after it. I'm not gonna stop. And not only that, 
not only does he keep stepping into the gifts that God has given him, but he also gives God credit. And that's the second thing, is in the midst of his circumstance, of this hard spot that he's in, in prison, Joseph is still giving God credit and giving him glory, really. So check this out. This is uh, Genesis uh, 40. Uh, eight, the uh, end of verse eight. So he says, interpreting dreams is God's business. Joseph replied, go ahead and tell me your dreams. Interpreting dreams is God's business. If you look at Joseph's, Joseph's life and you look at all the things that he's done, he's like, not that it would be right, but Joseph, he, he totally could be boastful about himself. He could be like, yeah, I'm really good at running these households. I'm great at this management stuff. I'm an amazing leader. Like, I'm my father's favorite. All these things. Like, he's got that track record to go like, look, man, I'm, I'm pretty cool. But right when they ask for something, he goes, oh, yeah, don't you know that God is good? Don't you know that God is able to do these things? He gives God the credit. He's not like, oh, yeah, I can interpret dreams. I'm really good at this. He's like, no, no, no. Don't you know that that's God's business? Like God can do these things and he gives God credit in the midst of all that he is going through. How? Seriously, it blows my mind. How? Because if we were extremely honest, that is not, 90% of the time, it's not how we respond. And maybe I'm speaking for myself, but that's hard to do. It's so hard to get to that place where literally everything is going wrong. And it's not even my fault. And I'm still going to go, but I'm going to trust. I'm going to keep moving forward. I'm not going to, like, he's got, like, some Rocky Balboa mentality. You know what I'm saying? He's like, hey, man, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. Come on. He's like, come on, let's go. How do you do that? It is insane. Those are miracles. It's exactly what those are. It is miraculous that he can keep moving forward that way. You know what Joseph reminds me of? He reminds me of a man named Andy. Has anybody in here seen the Shawshank Redemption? Come on, a lot of people, yeah. yeah. Last service, people were like, mmm. I was like, oh, geez, yeah. It's like, that's gotta be a favorite, right? It's like, it's a great movie, it really is. It's not like when you go home and watch with your like children, it's not PG, okay? Uh, but it is a good movie. So what happens in this movie is there's a man named Andy. Just to quickly summarize, Andy is wrong, wrongfully convicted of killing his wife and a man that she was having an affair with, okay? He did not do it, um, and so he's placed into prison for it. He ends up being in prison for 19 years to kind of fast forward, um, but while Andy is there, he makes friends with this guy named Red. Red is played by Morgan Freeman, and uh, they, they just built this really cool relationship, a really special bond, and the whole time that they're there, one thing that they see amongst all the other prisoners is there's guys who have been in there for so long that they, they become dependent on the lifestyle of prison itself. Like, so the, the way that Red describes it, and we'll read his quote here in a second, is he's saying that they become so dependent on just what they've experienced. Their circumstance, like we talked about earlier, has bled into who they are. And they need it to basically survive. So here's what Red, here's how Red actually says it in the movie. It says, these walls are funny, these prison walls. First you hate them, then you get used to them. Enough time passes, you get so that you depend on them. That's institutionalized. He's like, that is exactly what happens to all these guys in here. They've been here for so long. They're like, hey, all right, we get our freedom now. They're out finally. And they're like, I don't know how to live life. I can't handle it. This is too much. It's overwhelming. I wish I was back in my cell. It's a very real thing that they experience. And so him and Andy had this conversation. But Red notices something about Andy. A lot of the guys do. They're like, he's different. See, there's something about Andy. The whole time, if you watch the movie, he is always striving to improve things, Right? He's, it's like he has goals, right, in prison. He's not just like, dude, I was wrongly convicted. Again, a lot of us would be in that situation. I'd be in there moping like, I didn't do nothing. I'm just chilling, man. I'm just doing my time, you know. Bed, hit the weights, back to bed. You know what I mean? That's it, eat my food. He's like, no, no, no. Andy comes in and he, he helps run this library. Andy comes in and he helps the guys get drinks on a day when it's hot outside and they're, you know, tarring a roof. Like, he, he builds relationship. Uh, he, he finds things for him to do to fill his time. He literally starts working for the warden, doing, keeping books for them and, and these other guards. And like, he just does all these amazing things and he just, he just keeps moving. He stays himself. Like, he's his own self, for sure. And they're like, he's a little different, but he stays himself. You see, what Andy does is, just like Red was talking about, he makes sure that the circumstances, the prison walls remain the prison walls, that they don't bleed into who he is. He stays the same all the way through. And if you know how the story, I'm gonna tell you how it ends. So if you don't wanna hear this, cover your ears. It's been out for forever, y'all. This movie's older than I am. But literally, 
Don't shake your head, Matt. <laughs> he escapes. So the whole time he had had this little like rock hammer, this little one that he'd been using, you know, using to make like a, a somebody reminded me, it's like a little chess set and like all these other rocks, like these things. And at, behind this poster in his room, he had hit, hit breaking the wall, putting pressure on the wall. And eventually he got a whole hole through there and he, he escapes one night. He gets out and he goes to a beach in Mexico and lives happily ever after. But again, Andy was able to do that this whole time because he was protecting what was right here. He was like, I am not this place. I will not let this place define who I am. I will not let what's going on around me determine how the rest of my life needs to look. I will keep moving forward. That's Joseph. That's Joseph in his situation, in his circumstance. Joseph just jumps in. He's like, yeah, sure, I'll lead. I'm not just gonna sit in my cell and mope and be upset that things aren't going my way. I'm gonna keep moving forward. I'm gonna keep stepping, keep hitting away at the wall and believe that there's more, that God has more for me. How though? How do you get there? Because that is so hard, church, to mentally, emotionally, just even physically to be able to say, I'm gonna keep pressing on. How was Joseph able to do this? I'll tell you how. He really didn't do it. You see, what I believe the whole time is that God was doing the work for Joseph, that God was bringing things to Joseph. Joseph's ability to respond the way that he did really had nothing to do with his ability at all. God did it. God did it for Joseph. Here's, here's what I mean. Check this out. So look back at verses 21 and 23 at the end of Genesis 39, right when we find out that Joseph's being thrown into prison, it says this. It says, but the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord again was with Joseph and caused everything he did to succeed. Do you see that? I don't know if you know this today, church, but God is always the initiator. In every part of our lives, God goes before us, right? Right? I'm not a self-made man. I have not achieved what I have achieved because, of, because I'm great and I have the ability to. It's by the grace of God. Because God goes before me. God fights my battles. God protects me. God lays out a path before me. He picks the plan. And it, all I have to do is just submit and go, sure, I'll go that way, God. But it's all his handiwork. It's all his doing. That's the grace of God. That's the mercy and the kindness of our heavenly father. He does the work and we get to step in. He initiates. He pursues us and says, come on in. He's the initiator. And you see that in Joseph's story, right? Again, think 1 John 4, 19. We love each other because he loved us first. This is him with Joseph. He loves Joseph. He's like, hey, I love you. I'm right here. I'm right here. Check this out, right? So we go down to verse 20. Look at verse 21 again. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. So what is God doing? What, what's God doing here? God was with Joseph. God was present in Joseph's circumstance. How many times do we feel left? Do we believe the lie that we're abandoned by God and we're just sitting in this place alone, that he's forgotten all about us? And God's like, don't you dare for a second. I'm right here. I am right here with you in the midst of this crazy hard time. I know it's awful, but I can promise you, I am with you. And we see that again, the Lord was with Joseph. He was faithful to Joseph, faithful with his love to him. God was with Joseph. And then look at the end of 21 and into 22. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Right? He made him a favorite of the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. So not only was God with Joseph, but God had plans for Joseph. He was like, hey, I'm here. And you know what? We're not just going to sit in this space. Come on. How many of us, when we get into a really dark spot, a hard time, we're like, I just can't wait to be out of this. 
Like, I just, I, I can't wait to be done with this day, this week, this month, this year, this season of life. I'm so excited for what's next. And God's saying, you've got to stop doing that because I'm working right here. I've got growth for you here. I've got plans for you here. Even in the worst spots, there's good things to come from this. Don't miss out. Have you been there? God was with Joseph. He had plans for Joseph right there in the midst of all that was going on. He had work for him. He's like, hey, lead these people. Lead them, love on them. Let them see how you use the gifts that I've given you and give me glory for it so that they know these come from me, right? The cupbearer and the baker, let them know that I do this thing and I would love to help them with their dreams. I've got work for you right here, right now, not just later. And not only that, but in the midst of all of it, God had good for Joseph. These plans, what God wanted, they were good for Joseph. Verse 23, the warden had no more worries, right? Because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. Again, the Lord was with Joseph and he's like, and guess what? I'm going to pour out. Here's blessing in your situations. Here's success. Here's favor. That's God's heart for his people. It's like, hey, in in the worst of the worst, I want to bring good. I want to bring good. I know it's hard. And it's not even that it takes the bad to bring the good, but just know even in the bad, I want to bring good because that's who he is, church. God is good all the time. Come on, where y'all at? I'm just kidding. It's exactly who he is. Here's a way to to summarize this, okay? It's it's this, this idea that in the midst of all of our bad things, in the valleys, in the darkest and lowest places, we tend to look at only the bad. We put the blinders on and we focus in and just go, this situation is terrible. And that's what, that's what causes us to get into that place like Andy and Red were talking about, where we're the institutionalized and, and the, the, the outside circumstance bleeds in to our inner heart. It bleeds into who we are and that's not God's will for our lives. God can still bring good. Even in the worst of situations, God can still bring good. Take a look at this psalm. Psalm 23. This is King David. It says, the Lord is my... I don't have a slide for this. I'm going to read through. I'll be quick. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths. He brings honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. Everybody say, I will not be afraid. Come on. For you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect me and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me. In the presence of my enemies, you honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessing, God. I have more than I need because that's what you do. That's who you are. It's your nature. You give me everything. Surely your goodness and unfailing love. Surely, God, without a doubt, you will pursue me all the days of my life. And in the end, I will dwell in your house forever. That's God's heart for us. That's God's heart for Joseph. And sometimes we get it mixed up and we look at that specific part where I will not be afraid, right? Even though I walk in the, through the valley of the, sh- uh, the shadow of death or through the darkest valley, right? Some of us look at that and we go, oh, well, when I walked, because I walked past tense through the valley of the shadow of death, now I kind of don't fear evil. Now I feel a little bit better because I'm out of the valley. And this is the flip side. God's saying, be like Joseph and go, hey, even though I'm literally in the midst right now, that's what David says. He's saying present tense, even though I'm walking through the valley and things are hard and they're not going the way I wanted them to, I will trust you because you are with me and I know it. I know it, God. Right now, you've got good. That's your heart for me. Okay, let's wrap this up. I'm talking too much. This whole thing, all of it. Here's what Joseph was really doing. Joseph was holding on to God. Sounds real silly to say, but that's exactly what he's doing. Joseph was holding on to God. Here's the really important thing. We're called to do the exact same thing. Check this out, Hebrews 6, 18. So God has given both his promise and his oath. And these two things are unchangeable. They'll never go away, never change, never be different because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge, our safe place, the place that we can go to to be protected, can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. We can have confidence in our heavenly father. 
We can trust in him and his way and his will for our life. We can run to him in our deepest and darkest places. Places We are called to strive each time to respond like Joseph and hold on to the anchor for our souls that is Jesus Christ. It's what we're called to do. And God calls us to that because it's absolutely what is best for us. And hear me out on this. Quick disclaimer, because I don't want to sit in here and you guys are like, it just feels like you're telling me to suck it up, like to get through my pain and just be like, it's just part of life. It is, but at the same time, can I tell you that God cares about all those moments? The pain that you feel, it matters to him. The hurt that you're experiencing, it matters to him. These hard moments, they matter to him. He doesn't just say, hey, get up, keep going, like you'll be okay. No, no, he's like, hey, I understand. I know these are hard. I know this is challenging. I know that every part of this, it, it matters. It matters to him so much, okay? Like Taylor said, all, all the things that are happening, they matter to God. He's not just asking you to sweep the emotions under the rug. He's like, I'm here with you. You need to cry, tell me. You need to be angry, say it. I'm here with you. Look at the Psalms of King David. I love that she, she had mentioned that earlier. It's like King David, man, he would always start Psalms. He would pray to God or sing to God. And half the time he'd start and go, Lord, you done left me. You know what I mean? Like my enemies are killing me. They're hurting me, attacking me. Like what's going on? And he would kind of complain to God and be like, yo, what is this? Right? And God was cool with that. Because he's like, you can be real with me, man. I'm sorry about what you're going through. I hate it. I hate it too. But can I promise you that I'm with you? Can I promise you that in the midst of that, there's good things there. I've got plans. I've got work for you. Don't just get through it. Be there. And know that I'm with you, that I'm doing something, and it's going to be good. There's good to come. And David would usually close out. He wouldn't wouldn't really leave it there, but he would close out and go, hey, feels weird right now, God. This is rough, but I trust you, and I trust that you are with me, that you are for me. Last thing, how do we hold on then like David does or like David did, like Joseph did? How do we get to that place to go, okay, I'm I'm not going to let go? I think one step, just a practical thing that we can do is we can just shift our focus. Again, back to the the idea that when we're in a dark place and brokenness, sometimes it's all we see. And that's what floods our hearts. So instead they go, hey, there's more here. God, help me be reminded of who you are. Help me be reminded of your truth when the lies try to sink in, when they try to overtake me. Shift our focus on and remind ourselves who God is and what he can do and how much he loves us. It makes me think of Paul and Silas who were thrown in prison one time. And while in prison, right, they have this night where Paul pulls out the harmonica, you know, starts tuning it up a little bit, and they start worshiping God together. It says here, Acts 16, 25, 26, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Other people who might not have a relationship with Jesus, they're hearing this. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prisoners' doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Freedom from worship. Because they decided to worship the Lord in a dark circumstance, in a place that felt broken, in a place that made them feel alone and lost, they said, you're still God. You're still good. And I'm still gonna praise your name. And the walls came tumbling down, and they were free. Such a powerful thing. How many of us lose sight of that in our situations and circumstances? How many of us have never tried to give God that opportunity to show us who it really is? And just by stepping in and going, you know what? Let me remind myself of who you say you are and what you can say you can do, because it makes a world of a difference. He's with us. He'll never leave us. He's got plans for us. And what he has for us is always, always good, because it's who he is. Can we stand up, church? We're going to pray here. So what I want to, I want to challenge you guys to do, we're going to do baptisms here in a second. It's going to be amazing. We're going to celebrate. Can we make some noise for the people getting baptized one more time? Come on. This is great. So we're going to celebrate. But my challenge to you is even as we celebrate, maybe for you today, one of the biggest things you can do is you can talk to God about your circumstance. And you can invite him in And you can sing out this song we're gonna sing as we celebrate and you can give him glory even if things aren't going that way. Even if things are happening in a way that you would never want them to. If it all seems broken, be reminded that he's with you and give him the praise. 
And I promise you, his oath, right, his word, he'll never let us down. He will always give us what's best. Can we pray together? Jesus, thank you so much for this time. God, we love you and we're thankful. We're thankful for your promise, God, your your promise to love us unconditionally forever, God, to never leave us or forsake us, God, to walk through the valley with us, God, to provide for us and take care of us, to bring goodness when it all seems bad. God, give us the strength to hold on, to trust you, Jesus, with all of our hearts, to place our hope in you. We love you. God, we celebrate what you're doing today in this house and all the things that you're gonna do to follow. It's in your perfect name we pray, Jesus. Amen.